When you see this photo, I'm curious what you'd say it's a picture of. So I asked a bunch of people this question before the talk, and they all said it's a bird, of course. Some of them said it's a Baltimore Oriole, which it is. But what was interesting to me is that not a single person even mentioned the tree that's in this photo, which is a native black cherry. And here we see a beautiful meadow in the countryside. But how often do we stop to consider what that countryside's actually made of? So I took close-ups in this same field. And there must be hundreds of different species of plant on that landscape, all with their own unique personalities and microcosms of biodiversity they support. But do we ever see them as more than just a green backdrop? So what am I getting at? Simply put, we don't pay attention to plants. And this tendency has actually become so pervasive in our society that a couple botanists coined a term for it. And they called it plant blindness. And they defined it as the inability to see or notice the plants in one's own environment. Now, I have a slight issue with that term and definition, and I'll explain why a little bit later. But they bring up a good point. That is, despite the fact that we're surrounded by plants, we don't really see them. And I've watched this play out on so many different levels, even in the conservation field I work in. Plants don't always get the attention they deserve. Which I find strange, because we know that biodiversity is a foundation and forms the building blocks of ecosystems. But we somehow forget that plants are the glue that connect it all together. How can we develop sound conservation strategies if we don't consider plants? Because without the milkweed, there are no monarchs. Without flowers, no pollinators. Without pollinators, no food. Without the mangroves, no shoreline. Without forests and trees, no oxygen. Without plants, no life. They're critical to the functioning of our ecosystems, and yet we often don't even think twice about what's growing outside our doors. To put this in perspective, think of every headline issue you read these days about the environment. The insect apocalypse, the age of extinction, habitat loss, biodiversity loss, deforestation, wildfires, even declines in human health. All of these issues can be traced back, at least in part, to how we as individuals in a society think about and manage plants. So we really can't afford to ignore them. A lawn, a familiar picture, this is a perfect illustration of what it looks like when we ignore plants and the critical role they play in our ecosystems. Because it may look neat and tidy, but from an ecological perspective, it has almost no value. Compare it to that meadow I showed you earlier which supports hundreds, if not thousands, of species all across the food chain. A lawn supports maybe a handful at best. So if a perfectly manicured lawn represents plant blindness, what then's the alternative? Well, I would actually say the alternatives are endless, because when we start to pay attention to plants, we quickly discover there's a lot we can do to support the planet. But today I want to show you one example of what that can look like by sharing my experience in my own backyard. So several years ago, I moved onto a small piece of land here in Virginia, and it consisted of a mowed lawn and some trees here and there. And as I was working in conservation with landowners across Virginia uh, to, to support biodiversity, I knew that what I did at home was going to matter just as much as what I did in the office to conserve wildlife. So the first thing that I did, I stopped mowing. I stopped mowing any area that I didn't use regularly for recreation or walking paths. And this accomplished two important things. First, right off the bat, I was starting to create some structure and diversity on the property. And we know that the more levels and niches and height and resources, the more species a property can support. Think of a house. The more rooms, kitchens, floors, the more people can live there. The second thing it accomplished is that it allowed me to see, for the first time really, what was actually growing on the property. And let me just say, I was astounded by some of the incredible native plants I was starting to find. Now, I don't have time today to discuss why native plants in particular are so incredibly valuable, but there are a lot of great resources out there to learn about that. But I found carpets of native wild strawberry, which are so sweet and delicious. There was purple top grass everywhere, which some of you probably recognize. It's growing everywhere right now. And it's a fairly common native grass here in Virginia, but it also happens to be a host plant for skippers, which are important pollinators. Here's a photo of a skipper. And I found it on ironweed, 
which is also growing in the property and is a pollinator favorite, and those blue-eyed grass, which is one of my personal favorites. I mean, just imagine looking down and thinking you're going to see grass, and instead you see these tiny blue stars peeking up at you. And I found orchids. Native wild orchids were growing in a patch that had been cut by a lawnmower every single year and never, get, never given an opportunity to grow. So my next steps were clear. I knew I wanted to do whatever I could to support these amazing species I was finding. And I did this in a number of ways. For example, if I found an oak seedling, I would put a little cage around it to protect it from deer and help it grow. There was a patch of native dogwood, and they were being tangled up and covered in invasive vines. So I removed the vines so I could help that patch thrive. I even used mowing as a tool in certain areas to promote plants that I wanted and to remove plants that I didn't want. And even at this point, without planting even a single plant, just by changing my mowing and management strategies, I was already starting to tip the balance towards a more functioning ecosystem and more wildlife habitat. And then from there, I started to plant some plants. The first thing I planted, of course, was common milkweed. Now, this species does a really great job spreading on its own. I only started with two plants. But now I have a huge patch, and I find monarch caterpillars, red milkweed beetles, dozens of other species that depend on milkweed. And if this photo is any indicator, the property just started to come to life. I find more and more insects and pollinators every year. All of these photos were taken on the property, some on native plants that I planted, and some on native plants that were already growing in the property and I just allowed to grow. Like the horse nettle in the upper right-hand corner. I like to point that one out because it's considered an annoying weed, but it's actually a really important native pollen resource for our bumblebees. So I, I let it grow. Foxes, raptors, they're regular visitors in the unmowed areas of the property because that's where they hunt for their food. I even saw bobwhite quail the last three years in a row. Now, they don't live on the property because it's not really large enough to support a population year-round, but every time they pass through, they find refuge and protection in the tall grass and in the blackberry patches I promote. I managed to get this photo as it's scurrying across a path into the tall grass. And I see more birds of all kinds. The hummingbirds find nectar resources in some of the native plants I've planted. The bluebirds and other birds find insects and caterpillars to feed their young in the tall grass and, in the, black, and, and in, the, in the native trees. And I even saw a common snipe last year, which was a huge surprise, but of course, you can probably guess, it was spending all its time in the unmowed areas of the property. And what's been really interesting is that throughout this time, as I've been working to transform the property, I've actually been transformed too. For one, I realized I didn't need to go elsewhere to connect with the land and to promote biodiversity, I could do it right in my backyard. And I also started to connect with and integrate myself in these communities and ecosystems that I was trying to promote through growing my own food in the garden and foraging for the abundant food and medicine that was already growing on the property. Common weeds like plantain, dandelion, violet, they make amazing food and medicine that I've come to depend on. But perhaps the most important takeaway that I've started to feel hopeful and empowered because even small changes I was making on my own property were having a noticeable positive impact. So think about it. The majority of land in the US, for example, is privately owned. So the implications are enormous as more and more of us start to rethink how we manage the land. Now, I know some of you may be thinking, well, I don't own or manage land, so what can I do? Well, parks are a great example. Here's a photo of signage that I took in a in park in New York that's discussing the value of grassland habitat for biodiversity. So there are parks, schools, churches, offices, roadsides, power line cuts, all of these shared spaces that could be managed differently to promote wildlife, and you may be the one we need to lead change in your community. Alternatively, just think of the other infinite ways you connect with plants, personally. Think about those contexts in your life like the food system. Think about how those can be improved when we start to really pay attention to the value of plants again. I guarantee there's not a single person in here who doesn't connect with plants on a daily basis. I'm sure many of you have a garden. Some of you have maybe even found a monarch caterpillar on milkweed that you planted. 
I would also guess that every single person in here has probably tried aspirin. Well, look up its connection to the willow tree sometime. We all eat fruits and vegetables, or at least we know we should. <laughs> we drink tea, coffee, eat chocolate. So many of us have given flowers to loved ones, or sat in the shade of an old oak tree. And I know I'm not the only person in here who's gone for a walk through the forest on a crisp autumn morning and just felt alive again. See, we're all connected to plants, so just imagine the world when we start to really see them again. And this brings me back to plant blindness. As I said earlier, I don't like that term or definition. Why? Because I'd argue that none of us are really plant blind. An inability to notice plants implies that we don't have a choice. But I believe that we do. We're not blind, we've just closed our eyes. We've stopped looking. We've built our houses, our walls, our cities, and we've forgotten that we are as much part of nature as every other creature on this planet. So we want to change the world. Let's just start by opening our eyes again. Look closely at the plants. Reconnect with the land. Tend the garden, plant the tree, lose the lawn, or just stop and smell the roses. It may be the most important thing that we do. Thank you.